Dear friends and colleagues, welcome to this 15-minute discussion on practical challenges and solutions as it pertains to treating bicuspid TAVI patients. My name is Nicolas van Michem from the Erasmus University Medical Center in Rotterdam, and it's such a big pleasure to be joined by two experts in the field, Professor Thomas Modin from Bordeaux and Professor Sonia Petronio from Pisa. So maybe to open up things, uh, we know that bicuspid disease is not a rare thing, 2% of all the uh, people in the world have a bicuspid valve and one in five might end up needing a valve replacement. So the first question then to Thomas as a surgeon, uh, what about um, bicuspid patients and uh, treatment selection? Do you think there is a place for uh, TAVI next to surgery in these patients? So thank you, Nicola, for the introduction. Um, so when I have a patient with a bicuspid valve disease, I would have different uh, things that I would look at for in the beginning. First of all, as a surgeon, when I open a valve, which is bicuspid, what's striking is that the amount of calcium is bigger and the distribution is different and the consistency of the calcium is different from the tricuspid patients, probably because it occurs also sometimes earlier. And so there may be a difference in terms of considering bicuspid in elderly and bicuspid in younger patients. So this is one. The other thing is sometimes I also always have in mind that uh, if you go beyond the leaflet disease it, the, itself uh, and the type of bicuspid, which is very important to consider, so type zero may be easy, type one, if you have a, a rough way, which is already fibrotic and calcified, maybe a challenge for TAVI. This is something I consider. But if we go beyond, you know, like me, that some patients have a, an aortic elastopathy that means that the patient will keep on dilating over time, uh, the, the annulus, but also the ascending aorta. And uh, as always, I think as doctors, we have to keep the door open for uh, uh, event, uh, eventual uh, uh, treatments. And that's why when I have a patient with a bicuspid, I look at the leaflets, the calcium distribution, and I look at the potential of the evolution of the disease itself together with the expectancy of life of the patient, as easy as it is. But uh, TAVI is definitely doable and feasible in, 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 in bicuspid. What, what is your perspective, Sonia, on uh, selecting bicuspid patients for TAVI? Well, let's say that nowadays the selection of a bicuspid it is more straightforward, not because it's changed the bicuspid, but all the devices have changed. To have a device with a retrievable and repositionable valve, and uh, we know more about different aspects of the bicuspid, and there are different ty typology makes things easier for us. And that this is why even the experience in bicuspid with TAVI has been increasing in the last years, definitely. So, uh, Nicola, this is my turn to ask you this question. What do you think, if I ask you to put together your experience, what I've said and what Sonia has been alluding to, and the current state of the art with the bicuspid, what's your opinion on that? So I think, uh... Um, TAVI definitely works in patients with bicuspid disease, but if we then look at sizing algorithms, um, we need to be uh, cognizant that a bicuspid valve is not a tricuspid valve. And you already referred to the amount of calcium um, and several, uh, there are several opinions uh, whether we need to um, adjust sizing algorithms in bicuspid disease. Um, we have the Bivolute X trial that was a prospective study in 150 patients that looked into different sizing algorithms based on annular sizing or annular sizing in combination with sizing at the commissural level. Turns out that 50% uh, 50, 50, 50 split, so almost 50% were based on annular sizing, the other 50% on a combination, on a hybrid approach. And it turns out that in terms of valve performance, but also valve deployment and expansion, there was not a big difference in the two sizing algorithms. So in general, you could claim that um, the sizing algorithm in bicuspid disease should not be so different from tricuspid disease and could focus on the annulus by itself. 
That said, a recent paper clearly demonstrated uh, that the combination of a calcified raffe and a lot of calcium in the valve leaflets is not a good association. And those patients might be better patients for uh, surgery if they can be treated at a relatively lower surgical risk. But I know that uh, Sonia also has a, a good opinion on sizing algorithms. Yes, Nicholas, you're right. We try to try a solution on the battle that we had between superannular measurements and annular sizing. And we thought that definitely annular sizing is easier for any uh, center. So what we try to do is to focus to see if some of the morphological aspects that are superannular, like the raffe, like calcification, when they have an um, impact, then they need to impact and reduce the size of the annulus diameter that we generally measure. Otherwise, it, with the same algorithm, we are able to see that if these aspects are not there, then traditional annular measurement is perfect. So, so we also know from, uh, from the Bava registry that in the majority of cases, there is no tapering uh, from the annulus towards the superannular level. And that is potentially the reason why uh, also in Bivolute X, we did not see a difference between the two sizing algorithms. But in case it is, so where you do see that the size trims down at the level of the commissures because of the raffe and the, the extent of calcium, are you concerned uh, of selecting a smaller valve size and ending up with a prosthesis patient mismatch? What is your opinion on that? Well, if the raffe, it's important, um, the the, the main aspect is you tend to undersize, you have to undersize, but the importance is, and we, we probably, uh, everybody knows that the valve has to be very high because like this, you don't give an impact and you reduce the chance of having um, a more a higher gradient, definitely. But I mean, about this, I would like to ask to Thomas, what is your feeling in uh, some uh, morphological complexity that bicuspid have instead of tricuspid when you do a procedure? I mean, what generally you tend to look and you need to do to have a good result? Thank you, Sonia, for the question. In addition to what you have been discussing with Nicola with, uh, about the importance of sizing itself, which is the main challenge for me, I think to, one, one main question may rise in, in the bicuspid practice is do we need a predilatation? And if we do a predilatation, what is the balloon sizing? And if we do also predilatation, do we still need the post dilatation? And I think everything is driven by the importance of the calcifications and the distribution of the calcifications. So, in, in addition to considering predilatation or uh, post dilatation, I think everything is driven by the anatomy and uh, the type of the bicuspid itself. So this is a multifactorial uh, approach about the importance of pre or post dilatation. Nicola, maybe you can uh, comment on that by sharing some more insights from the accumulating data that we, we have so far. Yeah, I think what, what, you, what you were saying are really the, the essentials for bicuspid TAVI treatment. And uh, I think the importance of uh, balloon pride pre dilatation is much more significant in bicuspid disease versus tricuspid disease. So as a matter of fact, in Bivolute X, there was a strong recommendation to do a predilatation in all the patients, and that was respected in 90% of the cases. But also post-dilatation occurred quite frequently in more than 50%. And all of that to obtain a, a valve that is as circular as possible and to improve or to get the best hemodynamic performance of these valves. So I totally agree with you that uh, pre-dilatation with or without post-dilatation are key for good results in bicuspid disease, regardless of the valve platform that you use. But of course, we all know that the supraannular functioning Evolute system has the advantage as it is the best in class in terms of hemodynamic performance and the lowest gradients uh, after the valve is implanted. Still uh, also from Bivolute X, but it has been duplicated in all the retrospective analyses from the TVT registry and others. There is a, 
a persistent neurological event rate and a disabling stroke rate of around 3%. And that is still concerning. And uh, that brings us to the discussion of the need for uh, embolic protection devices. Um, as you all know, I'm, I'm a proponent of embolic protection devices in all patients who undergo TAVI, but um, in particular for bicuspid patients, for the reasons that we discussed earlier that Sonia referred to, and also you, Thomas, uh, that there is a different pattern of calcification in the aortic root that also uh, potentially is associated with more debris embolizing to the brain might be a plea for uh, embolic protection in, um, in patients with bicuspid uh, TAVI. Okay, now, I think it's time to wrap up. And we had said a lot of things about bicuspid, a lot of interesting things that let us know that we have more details now on bicuspid patient and on bicuspid procedure. Also the sizing that let's say there is not a complete consensus, but we know that at least uh, the 60 or 70% of patient can be sized through the annulus. But indeed, there are 30% of other patient, especially with type 1, that need to have a special algorithm because the raphe and the calcium are of important impact. I would say that we have, of course, instead a definite consensus on the procedure, on the way you are able to implant a TAVI in a bicuspid patient. We know how to implant, what to do with predilatation, what to do with postdilatation. And now that we know that we have a valve like the Evolute with a superannular valve that has a C mark for bicuspid, well, I think I will tell you to go, everybody to the training village, exercise, get deeper in details on bicuspid because it's a very interesting subject. So I would say, wrapping up, thank you to Medtronic and good evening.